Up at Unicorn in here. I just, um, a couple of hours ago, I watched a live stream by Jonathan, who is the honest truth. Please remember to like the video as you come in. That does wonders for pushing me through the YouTube algorithm. So there were so many teachable moments and so many things to learn um, during that live stream. We had a lot of fun towards the end. We started blaming the end of the world on weave because people make a huge deal out of it. But really, um, I think we learned a lot. I think that panel was so long like it was like four or five hours, like maybe four to six. I, I, I don't remember. But basically, there were disagreement, heated disagreements that we lasted through them so long that we kind of wound up at some kind of a not agreement, but but respect. And I thought that that was beneficial when people are not too out of pocket. You can grow somewhere so conversation starts with obviously the the video and i'll link it below it's called kevin samuels won't help you get a woman which is true right some guy married to a woman named uh mimi uh who at the moment has a peace sign as an avatar uh neither one of them showed themselves i suppose he was jamaican and she was african-american but um he was telling the women they need to listen to Kevin Samuels and that's why every single one of them on the panel was single. That wasn't a true statement. However, the bigger statement that he's not looking at and that a lot of people aren't looking at is like, well, Kevin is single too. Kevin is single. He's twice divorced. He has admitted to sleeping with hundreds of women, including married women. Um, tried to pretend he was on a date with uh, six, the goddess, uh, the, the beautiful sister who was six feet tall. And of course, you know, she wasn't down with that. She didn't agree to that, but like just, it's amazing how these men feel like, oh, Kevin Samuels is really trying to rebuild the black family. He's really trying to increase black unity. I'm just like, this man was exposed for saying a few years ago that black women are genetically less attractive than white women. I mean, this is purely like, the depths and the leagues of internalized racism because because nothing is true about that i'm a black woman my mom is a black woman my sisters are black women and they're all beautiful and um i quite fancy the way that african-american look over lots of groups of women i quite fancy the way that uh a lot of African women look. I quite fancy the way Somali women look. I quite fancy the way that women from Mali look, right? And Somali and Mali, like th this is totally different sides of Africa, by the way. Uh, Mali is in the West and um, Somali is in the East, East Africa and the Horn. And um, I quite fancy the way that these women look and these women don't have they don't have any significant white ancestry. Sure, you can find droplets among them who have it, but the point is for somebody to say that, for somebody to say that white women are inherently and naturally and genetically more beautiful than black women, it's just, you have to look at that person and call that person what they are. How could a person who thinks this, how could a person who thinks that black women are so worthless, how could a person who revels in this blood sport of humiliation be somebody who cares about the black family? I mean, if he cared so much, he would have one. Allegedly, this man is 50 years old with no kids. Some people say the daughter is his. Some people say it's a stepkid. Something's going on. You're 50 with no kids, no wife. You're alone. You're, you're all the way single. No fatherhood, no husbandry, no nothing. Is there something you want to tell us? Maybe there's something you don't want to tell us. But what's clear as day is that this is a man who loves black men and hates black women, which is not uncommon in the manosphere where he comes from. And the thing is, there were people on the panel who were basically telling Jonathan, who is the honest truth, that he was being divisive. And this is why sometimes a black man can uh, show up in the world as the white people among black people. What do I mean by that?
when you try to talk about race and, and institutionalized racism and culture, white people will say, oh, well, if you don't talk about race, it'll just go away. Why are you being divisive? And it's just like, dude, institutionalized racism has changed the fabric of our lives. Like, why is talking about it or calling out something that affects us every day divisive? And I'm just like, you know, the honest truth is holding black men accountable in a way that people allege Kevin Sanders is holding black women accountable. And I'm just like, why is it divisive when Jonathan does it, but it's not divisive when Kevin does it? And these people just can't see past their own noses. They can't see past their own feet, past their own hypocrisy. Like some people, I mean, a lot of these people, I mean, I got to be honest, this didn't strike me as this particular married couple, with all due respect, they didn't strike me as bachelor's degree holders, master's degree, anything like that. They didn't strike me as a very educated couple. And unfortunately, we have, um, and I don't want to hear that nonsense about, you know, the white man's education, blah, blah, blah. If you have a brain on your shoulders, you can sift through what is racism and what is indoctrination and what is truly beneficial knowledge when you go to an institution of higher learning because it's all there. It's all there. So these people began by saying that, you know, black women don't smile enough and the way that we carry ourselves is aggressive and all these different things. But it, it, the conversation hovered around why black women don't smile enough. And it was amazing to see that black men fail to make sense out of why young black women especially, or all black women in general have this resting B-I blank blank face. And I'm just like, do you know how many men take smiling as an invitation? There are so many times I have smiled at people just trying to be polite and have good Southern manners. And all of a sudden they run me off the road. They think that I'm sending them a signal like, like, like a smile as an invitation instead of a courtesy. And because of that, especially as young girls, we learn to straighten our face. We learn not to make eye contact. I, I kid you not, in middle school, I stared at the ground. I looked down in my posture so much so I could recognize my peers by their shoes. Without looking up, I could say, oh, what's up, Keandre? Hey, Danny, why don't you move out my way, David? What's up, Sharice? Ernestine, I got in, in, like, without looking up. Without looking up. Now, for me to be that way in middle school means I had to have learned that lesson sometime in, what, elementary school? Because here's what will happen, because... <sighs> Even black women will do this thing where they blame black women in hopes of being picked by black men. If you come home and you're being harassed by some boy or some man, it's like, well, what did you do? And it's like, I didn't do anything. He asked me my name and I, well, what was you smiling all up in his face for? Hear that phrase? I know you've heard it before, smiling all up in his face. You could have just flashed a quick smile. Like, oh, I'm, I'm being polite. Oh, he spoke, so I spoke. He said, hi, how you doing? I said, oh, I'm doing fine. This is why some women, men be like, dang, you can't say hi? No, I can't say hi because you think it's an invitation to guess what's underneath my clothing. I, I can't say hi. And even if I can say hi to you as an individual who doesn't act like that, I've had too many experience with people who do to take the risk. I've learned from trial and error, and I'm sorry if you're an exception to the rule, but I'm not, mm -mm. I, I'm not doing that. It's for my own safety. And so this thing about black women not smiling became a conversation about, let's keep it, let's keep it a buck. You want a woman to smile at you, some random woman in the street you're smiling at and you want to talk to, you want her to smile at you, but if she was your woman, your daughter, your mother, you wouldn't want her smiling up at a bunch of random men. I have had and heard so many men and so many women in my life and the lives of other women saying, don't be out here smiling at these N words. Don't be out here, you know, blah, blah, like, because they know how men can take it. 
Now, Cher, I smile. I show all my teeth to children. I show all my teeth to animals. I show all my teeth to the elderly. But like... The, I guess the general population of adults. I am. Um, I have a very friendly face. Um, I think I used to look mean when I was younger, but for some reason, the older I got, the softer uh, my expressions became. And um, I look so nice. I attract crazies. I attract people who you know want to follow you off the bus and onto the next bus, even though they're not even going that way. And it's like, good, good, good grief. I was just trying to be nice. I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want to know you. It was just good day, good day to you too. This is how, this is why resting B word face, you know, emerged from the ghettos. I remember Adrian Bailon of The Real, Adrian Bailon Houghton was talking about, I mean, cause, cause this is like 410, 411. She's a munchkin adorable little Puerto Rican girl, but she's a munchkin. And she, and she always mean mugs because she's so little, like, like that was, that's how she developed her defenses. Y'all know we can't be in these ghettos, in these streets, being all friendly and pink and, 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 and girly. We're going to end up kidnapped, sexually assaulted, called easy, uh, slandered and whatever else we, we, ha we have to cover those things. And it's like, oh, we want more feminine women, more feminine women. And I'm just like, we don't live in, a, in an environment conducive to that. Now, when I'm in, you know, whitey white land, when I'm in Pleasantville, when I'm in, you know, Bellevue, Washington and Issaquah Highlands, like, sure. Back home in the Pacific Northwest, sure. I could be all kind of smiley. Those men on those streets with those Starbuckses that are built like mansions, honey, they have way too much to lose. I think there was a guy or two who tried to put me in their car, but I'm just like, I could say no. And they would just take the first no as an answer. They didn't continue to follow me up the street or pull over or try to run me off the road. And this is in my thirties still, you know, be polite to a guy. It's like, Oh, where are you going? Why don't you get in my car? I can take you where you're headed, bro. No, I walk this road all the time. I'm almost home. Thank you. No, thank you. Like, why doesn't this make sense? Like, how do you not see things from our point of view? It, it's a strange lack of compassion. It's a strange lack of empathy. Like, it's not that we want to be rude. It's not that we want to hurt you. It's not that we want to be hostile, but it's just, we don't live in an environment that is conducive to all that friendly friendly. So, we got to a point where there is this really beautiful exchange between our wonderful regal sister with a bougie hair, Loren, and Stampitis. I don't really know who Stampitis is, but I know he's got a child with a good woman. And the conversation with them was significant because black men are saying that, you know, 20% of black men are responsible for 80% of black babies and we're all sleeping with future. And, um, he is not a Pookie or a Ray Ray, but he does have a baby mama. And if he leaves her, she's a statistic. And we were all saying, well, why don't you marry her? Marry her then. You guys are always talking about baby mamas, including him. And then he was, he thought he could justify himself like, oh, well, I'm still with her. And I'm just like, yeah, but if you leave her, she's a statistic. Marry that woman. Marry that woman. It's already an out of wedlock child. Marry that woman. I mean, if you don't want to contribute to the problems because he and all these other men will sit there and talk about baby mamas. And I'm like, okay, but you create them. Like it takes two. Babies are not a woman's fault. They're not a man's fault. It takes two. And when I hear men say that babies are a woman's fault, I'm like, just say that you're pro-choice. Just say that you support abortion. You will be the same men clowning African-American women for having abortions and then at the same time say it's her fault for having a baby and she feels forced to have an abortion. Now, here's the deal. Some African-American women are truly churched and truly Christian and they might not believe in fornication, but they fall into that kind of temptation because it's a human need. But then when they get that baby, their faith and Jesus the Christ, the son of Mary, 
does not allow them to kill a baby. And you mock them for that. You, you, you mock them for that. Oh, you baby mama, you this, you that, like. And then that turns into like like uh, the, the Mimi woman who everybody was calling pick Mimi. Um, she was saying, well, who's raising these men? And I'm just like, you know, they're single mothers. And she was like, and who's raising these women? And we're like, okay, well, they're single mothers. Here's the deal though. Are these mothers messing up? Absolutely. Here's the deal. Women don't know how to teach men how to be men. I mean, we can give you some guidance. We, we can show you some models, but manhood is passed down from, from man to boy. It, 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 it's, it's passed down. It, it's tossed like a baton. Womanhood is a bit more innate, but manhood is, is such a huge rite of passage. Like it's such a, it, it, it's damn near a secret society because we have a lot of men who are not men. They're just grown boys, Jody, baby boy. And I'm just like, how are you able, how are you so able to blame the parent who stayed and not the parent who left? And this uh, Mimi character, who's married to the to a Jamaican, she was just like, well, a man ain't gonna stay in the house if it ain't no peace in the house. Well, then leave the house, but don't leave your kid. Once you know that you have a living, breathing child, there's no excuse. I mean, unless you sign them papers over for adoption, foster care, something like this, in order to ensure that the kid has a chance at life, if you didn't do all of that, there's no excuse for you to abandon it. I don't care if your baby mama came from hell. Get custody of that kid and cut her off. You got a kid that you used to take care of and you mean you left its life and you let it struggle because you didn't like the mother. That's crazy how so many men feel about the kids they have the way that they feel about the mother. Some men, if they love the mother of the child, they will love the child. If they dislike the mother, they will dislike the child. And we talk about women all day, how women are like, oh, you look just like yo daddy, blah, blah, blah. My mama said that to me all the time, all the time. But my mama raised me, clothed me, clothed me fed me. I look like my dad. I act like my dad. I walk like my dad. I emote like my dad. My dad used to call me twin. Twin. I look like every one of my dad's children, but none of them look alike because I look the most like him. I didn't start to resemble my mother until my late teens. I was an adult before her cheekbones started to show up in my face. And my mom would just be like, Ooh, you would swear your daddy took you behind a mountain and isolated and in an isolated cave raised you all by himself because my mannerisms and personality are his. But at the end of the day, my mama still raised me, fed me, clothed me, kept me, you know, like took me to the hospital, wiped my boo-boos, disinfected, whatever, bought me my bras and my cheerleading uniform and drill team uniform and, and pageant dresses and whatever I needed. How am I gonna how am I gonna get mad at the parent who was there and who did their best to raise me and not at the parent who didn't think I deserved it. My parents were married. Sure. My parents divorced. Thank God. My dad told our pastor he didn't feel like we deserved certain things. And we were a house full of little girls with one boy. He didn't feel like we were entitled to his money. He didn't feel like we were entitled to his protection and provision. My mom used to write his name on Christmas gifts, trying to dupe us. And I'm like, mama, this your handwriting. This the same stuff on my permission slips. Like, who are you fooling? He don't love us, do we? He don't want us, do we? My little sister, my beautiful, wonderful little sister was born while my parents were married. I have another brother who I'm the same age as and we don't have the same mom. Papa was a Rolling Stone. Wherever he laid his hat, that was his home. We make excuses for this stuff. 
We make excuses for this stuff. Boys will be boys. Let that man be a man. Like we make excuses for this stuff. But if a woman, you know, gets a job, raises her kids on her own, and God forbid they end up going to jail, she's just a horrible person creating poopies and ray rays. And I'm just like, dude, you don't think the neglect of a father has anything to do with that psychology, that psychological mess? And Mimi uh, from the panel. Uh, who was married to the Jamaican, she said that one day her daughter, her dad told her, you act like a man, you're masculine. And she said that obviously, you know, her dad wasn't in her life. She knew him, but he didn't raise her. And um, basically she was raised by her mom and her mom was a no nonsense. I ain't taking no ish from no man type of woman. And she became that way and she had to, and this is with all due respect, but she basically had to become a big me. And it was it was all over her voice because I'm just like there needs there's a balance that needs to be struck because love is a need of love, right? We have to be kind to one another. Kindness matters. And I'm just like black women are at fault for so much, but so are black men equally, if not more so. I presented the analogy of, you know, when a football team messes up, you know, it's the coaches, it's the it's the coaches and captains. That's who's held accountable. That's who the burden falls down on. Sure, they lost as a team, but I'm just like, you're not going to be out here asking for submission, asking for leadership, asking to to pull the strings on our bodies and on our lives like we're Pinocchio dummies. And then, oh, well, you know, it's not my responsibility. She messed up. OK, but you're the one pulling the strings. Are you the are you the head or are you the tail? The tail doesn't move without the head telling it, you know, go right, go left, up, down, or all around. That's not how this works. Don't say that you're a leader or you're the captain and then not want to be responsible for your team. This this doesn't make any sense. And we have so many Black women who want to make it make sense because they're dying to be loved and chosen and validated. There is this guy, I forgot his name. Um, dude, what was your name? I mean, Jedi Mike was up there. A guy named Bello, AT, Miss J, Stampitis, Alexander Brennan. Who was he? Mr. Dargo? I don't know. Um, come on, Chocolate Bank. Now I lost my point. You know, it's so funny. The Jamaican guy had heat for the honest truth until the honest truth told his wife, uh, let me talk to your husband. <laughs> he was just like, I'm not about that life. I'm not about to sit here and, and yell at women and tell women what they need to do. I am a man who holds me accountable. Put your husband on the phone. And from the background, he was like, people like you causing division. But when he got up there, he was like, well, man, it's not that I disagree with. I, I, I hate that kind of stuff. I hate that kind of stuff because I, I, I'm i all about the same energy. I'm an Aries. I'm, I'm all about keeping the same energy. Don't talk to me in a way from, from afar that you won't talk to me up close. Otherwise, just don't do that from afar stuff. <laughs> this is why, like... I interact on YouTube exactly how I would in person. If there are things like I don't just drag people I don't know and start mess and and say heinous things because I know that nobody is untouchable. Somebody, I mean, reach out and touch somebody's hand, make this world a better place if you can. Like, nah, I'm good. I know that I don't know who's behind that computer screen. I know that I can say something to someone to tip them in the wrong way and end up with a stalker or whatever it is. And likewise, somebody could tip me the wrong way. And I'm just like, okay, but I'm local. Do you want to meet up? You know? So I, I don't treat people like I have a keyboard and a screen barrier. I try to treat people. I do treat people as I would treat them in person. I absolutely do. And um, this guy was telling the honest truth that he was causing division in the community. And I'm just like, how is he causing division? How? 
Shahrazad Ali is not causing division. Kevin Samuels is not causing division according to these men, but he, for showing the other side, is causing division. I mean, the, the hypocrisy made my stomach hurt. It, it made my stomach hurt. So Jedi Mike started talking about how, you know, his dad checks his mom and how they've been married for so long. And Jonathan was just like, you know, at the end of the day, your dad isn't God. Your, your, your dad isn't God. Human beings have flaws. They need help. And it's not all about checking the woman, checking the woman, checking the woman, especially if your man isn't perfect. Sometimes it's about checking you too. Some, it's called checks and balances, right? Some kind of homeostasis in the body and in the body of a relationship, like checks and balances. Mr. Uppity does everything for me. But every now and then, every now and then, if he is, you know, slightly to the left, I'm like, baby, you know, let's, let, let's get right. You know, we dole out apologies to one another. We dole out forgiveness to one another. We dole out mercy at one another because we need it. He is a perfect protector, a perfect provider, but that doesn't necessarily make you a perfect person. Maybe I am a perfect lover and a perfect companion, but that doesn't make me a perfect person. I mean, the melodrama, and, and it sucks because with me, melodrama is, is sincere to me. So I cry and I, Romeo and Juliet, Shakespearean, like, oh, I just am so sensitive. You know, men can, can think you're so cute and so cuddly and so funny, but they don't be about that drama life. They, they, they don't. They don't be about those, you know, <laughs> large, volatile emotions. Maybe when those emotions are super giddy, they think it's cute. But, you know, that is one side of, you know, a coin <laughs> of super intense emotion. And then there's the other side. Um, oftentimes, I feel like people don't understand that a relationship between a man and a woman is similar to a regular friendship. Like, y'all got to be friends. You got to get along. You got to care about each other outside of the bedroom, outside of the kids. When nobody else is looking, nobody else is around. And it's just the two of you. Your makeup is off. His whatever, you know, his job is done. And you're just laying there like like raw. Like you, you have to care about the raw individual. It's not just, oh, I'm a woman, so I'm always going to be wrong. <sighs> what in the gaslighting? That That's not true. It, it doesn't work that way. No man in a long-term relationship, no man in a long-term relationship thinks that way. Every man who has been married more than, you know, 10, 20 years, they've doled out some apologies. They've been wrong. They've messed up. They've been checked by their wives. And these men have this fantasy where they believe that, you know, women don't check men. Only men check women. And in a relationship, you check each other. Just like in a friendship, you're, you're, you're having a great time with your bestie. And, you know, your bestie might say something that you're like, oh, well, that was below the belt. My bad, my bad. And then the same thing could happen the other way around. It, it, it's weird that people don't consider that as a dynamic in a male-female relationship. It, it, it's so odd, the inferiority that people describe to women, because when you have two lesbians, they don't have that problem. Even though they have a butch and a fen, it's not like, oh, well, I'm the man, so everything I say is right and you submit. There's still cooperation there. When there are two men together, it's not, you know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the top, you're the bottom, so I'm right about everything and dominant. And, and no. But for somehow it's like, oh, well, check a woman, check a woman, and I can check a woman. If I can't check a woman, then I got to And I'm just like, dude, you guys check each other. It doesn't mean she needs to be clapping out her syllables or using swear words at you. But you guys have to be able to hold one another accountable or you are going to erode the ties of that relationship. This is how people fall apart. 
when you can't apologize, when you can't back up, when you can't heal a wound, that thing will fester and rot. Why, why is this not common knowledge? I mean, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but like this is this is a commonsensical thing to me. So many of these men, when you talk to them about being kind to women and understanding them as like, if you're really going to go for the women or weaker vessels, why do you talk to us like you talk to other men? I remember this guy was like, well, I'm going to tell you just like I would tell any other good. Blah, blah. And I'm just like, dude, but I'm not one. I'll tell you like I tell my dudes out here, man. Why are you crying? And I'm like, dude, why, why? Don't talk to me like that, though. Especially if you're expecting femininity because you're the way you're treating me makes me feel like I need to man up to protect myself. And I don't want to feel that way. So I'm either going to man up or disappear. And chances are, I mean, y'all y'all know me by now. I'm, I haven't been on YouTube long enough. You know, I am blocky on I will disappear from a chat, from a YouTube channel, unsubscribe, unmod you, like just bye. I, I can't handle, do not want to fight. Like, oh, I remember somebody got on my channel asking me about smoke and I was just like, mm -mm, I don't, I, I, mm, I got no smoke, no chimney, no nothing. I, I don't want any smoke. I don't want to get in these these perpetual fights that go on for years. I just, no. Mention me, I won't mention you, okay? Say my name, I'm not saying yours. I, I, I don't want to be three years later in the same space. My God, that is that is truly, truly insanity. Here's the deal. Everything doesn't have to be a fight. I think the guy, I think his name was Bello, this, this African guy from the UK, and he wanted to compare the UK to America so desperately, but I'm just like, it's not the same. We don't have the same dynamics, or we are not the same black people. We do not have the same struggle. Africans come here and they run circles around African Americans when it comes to success, but their kids who are born to them and the kids who are born after that, they end up being forced into an African-American context. And then their, their success level changes because of the mental conditioning. It's one thing to come from another country over here to America where you still have your culture and your goals and you were raised outside of this hell, out of this belly of the beast, out of this, outside of this insidious anti-blackness. And then, you know, the second generation really starts, you know, showing up in the prisons, showing up with, you know, dead babies, you know, preeclampsia, you know, dead kids in delivery rooms. Like, it, it gets that way. And I'm just like, y'all are not enslaved in the UK. Uh, the, the slaves in the UK came from the Americas. They were brought from the Americas. They, they were still us. They, they were still us. So the, the African immigrant is unlike the African American who did not immigrate by choice, who has a whole totally different cultural uh, indoctrination in dealing with whites especially. So he tried to make these comparisons and he was just like, yeah, you know, you just got to marry women from other countries. And I'm just like, you're in the UK. Why are you speaking for African-American men? Like, like, what's what's your life about that you identify so strongly with African-American men and you're not even one? Like, if you want to marry a woman from another country, I mean, you're from another country. Go, go, go for it. My thing is, black women, we don't want to stop you. Black women are past that point. Now you still have the pick me's who are still there. You still have the women who are willing to look at African-American women with all of their education, all of their beauty, all of their grace, all of their goodness and put you down because there's a black man in jail somewhere. There's a black man who lost his license because he wouldn't pay child support. But 
black women by and large, I mean, you see, we're, we're starting to swirl a whole lot more. We're starting, starting to divest. We're starting to be with men of other races. And I'm just like, we don't want to fight you on this anymore. We're saying if you're a colorist, it's okay with us. Maybe it's Whitney Houston. It's not right, but, but it's okay. I'm going to make it anyway. Like, do you? Like, like, like we don't want to fight. Does everything have to be a fight? Especially women who are working on their femininity. The last thing they want to do is get them up with a man. Like, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. If you, if you would rather be with some of these ratchet back alley backwoods, raggedy biracials out here on these YouTube streets, streets sleeping with everybody, but crap on a brown skin girl who's decent and educated, do that. If that skin and her white mother or father or whatever it is, if that skin makes you feel like somebody, do what you need to do to love you and be satisfied with your life. We're not trying to fight you on that front anymore. But I mean, as far as moving forward, I don't believe that we have to sleep with one another to move forward. I'm not on this, you know, this Dr. Umar Johnson, you know, we have to marry one another. No, we don't. People call me a swirler all the time, no matter how many times I say that I'm with a black man. But even if I wasn't, I could still sit at the table with black men and women and design a community program for children for black children. I could still do that. I could still have the heart and the manners and, and, and the intent to, to do good for our community. There are a number of black, of black people. I always tell people about Iman, the Somali model who married David Bowie, who what this woman has done for Somalia. Oh my goodness, this woman is Somali to the bone. And I'm telling you, her marrying a white man did not deter her not one bit from making sure that her love and her money and her efforts went to her people. It didn't stop her from being pro-Somali. African-American men and women who date interracially, they really have two totally different dynamics. You have the self-hating person who is just dying to, you know, live vicariously through somebody with lighter skin, blah, 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 and to say, look at me and my trophy, it means something. And then you have the group who is largely rejected by their population, by their own ethnic group. And they're just like, you know what? Y'all don't want me anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm about to go to people who do. In my estimation, the majority of the people who say, oh, look at me and my trophy are black men. The majority of the people who were unwanted and decided, you know what, I'm going to keep my standards no matter what. Even if it's outside of this race, I'm going to have a protector and provider who loves me. Those are the women. Now, are there exceptions to the rule? You betcha. Yes, there are self-hating black women who look for white men as trophies. And yes, there are black men who were isolated. My, my little brother is one. My little brother is top five best human beings alive. Really and truly has the heart and the personality of Michael Jackson, just tender, loving, kind, masculine, heterosexual. He's married to a white girl. You know, a lot of black girls are just like, you know, you soft. And I'm just like, he's, he's, he's full of the kind of tender love that we need to heal. He's full of the kind of devotion and loyalty. That woman ain't never been cheated on. That woman has a great husband. That, that woman has a husband who has zero problems cleaning up behind her, has zero problems raising a house full of girls and knows what it knows what it is to honor and respect a strong woman. <laughs> that woman, she blessed. He, he got slept on by a lot of his counterparts. So even though I think he's the exception to the rule, I'm just saying like, yes, these exceptions exist, but by and large, a lot of these black men are self-hating. And they make these interracial relationship dating choices because of self-hatred, whereas so many black women are actually self-loving. And they're just like, I'm not about to be called a B-word and a broad and all this hip hop music and nasty things. I'm not about to be treated this way. Like, I'm out of here. I'm going where the respect is. I'm going, you know, where I'm going to be put on a pedestal and adore. 
And if my big nose and dark skin won't get it for me here, I'll get it somewhere else. That's what's going on. And some of us are at ages where we, we really can't fix that. Some of our, our some of us are at ages where it's like, you know, we can do better about the youth, but you know, those of us who are 25 and up, my thing is for these black men to love Kevin Samuel so much and to say that women are hitting the wall at 25. If we hit the wall at 25, honey, like this is a picture of me when I was 31. Uh, if we if we are hitting the wall after 25, then why do you care if we did interracially or not once once we're over 25? Why do you care if that wall already happened and now we're no good? And we have no sexual market value and, you know, all this, that and the other. Why do you care if we're throwaways and you're so outnumbered with all these women to pick from? Why do you get mad? Why do you get mad at Serena? Wasn't she over 30 before she married Alexis? Oh, hey, Ann, why are you mad at Tika Sumter? Wasn't she over 30? Wasn't she over 25 when she married her white guy? Halle Berry, wasn't she over 30 or 40 before she married her white guy? Why, why are you upset? Aren't we trash after 25? So the choir of black men who support Kevin Samuels are saying things like this. Oh, you're just mad at the message because he's telling the truth. Black women are so used to being degraded. We're not actually mad at constructive criticism. Those of us who respect ourselves are mad at how it, it's a blood sport. You guys seem not to notice that he's calling these women B words and broads and cussing them out and belittling them and, and making them the butt of every joke. You know how much money we give people who, to tell us what's wrong with us, black women? Black women, whether it's a therapist, it's a counselor, it's a level up guru. Do you know how much money people give Crystal and Karazin for that pink pill course, pink pill for college, pink pill for business to say, hey, fix me. Tell me what's wrong with me and improve me. So don't lie to me. I personally, I personally, I personally. True, as, true to the level up as I can be, I was scammed by Michael a pink. I gave Michael a pink my money. I was in a Facebook group for a week and lost like, like a couple hundred dollars to this woman. For nothing, a damn group that she didn't even show up to. Literally paying people to tell me, you know what, you weigh too much. You know what, you talk too much. You know what, you're a little rough around the edges. You know what, you need to do this. You know what, you need a new wardrobe. That's not going to fly. Well, if you want this kind of man, yeah, that outfit is cute, but that's not what's going to get him. You need to learn about this. Pick up this book, right? They had us reading all kinds of books. I mean, they had us reading uh, Ho Tactics. They had us reading Men Don't Fall in Love with Women Like You by Gio Lambert. I mean, they had us reading the goods, the goods, y'all. I mean, we were just printing out all kind of PDFs for people who couldn't buy the book and not in Michael's group because I was in Michael's group and I was in a couple of other uh, love love groups uh, for black women. And I was in some groups as well where the women were already leveled up, like the exes of Michael B. Jordan and whatnot leveled up. So we shared that kind of information in order to elevate ourselves. But I'm just saying like for you to say that women don't want to be held accountable, that's not true. We literally, we, we literally dole out cash money to be told, where did I go wrong? And will you help me go right? We just don't want to be abused. That man is single because he's mean. He's an old, honorary, cranky old black man. And you know he is. All of his red bottoms and, and shoe collections and suits, it, it, it's not going to mask what you see in front of you. This picture I took when I was 31. This picture I took yesterday. So... Now that I've moved from my early 30s to my mid 30s, if I were to be with a white guy, hell, this is the wall. Why do you care? And if you're just going to 
beg me so everywhere I go. People call people beg me to call into the Kevin Samuel show. And I already made a video called stop asking me to call in. I already have what he says I don't deserve. Now, when I talked to Mr. Uppity about it, he's like, I'm changing your YouTube diet. I do not appreciate what you're watching and what it's making of you. And I'm like, you know, sir, I yield. <laughs> okay. But like, this is a picture of a six foot, 200 and something pound woman. I absolutely need to lose weight. But I'm not some dang tree monster by any means. So me being my age, me being my weight, me being all that I am, Kevin would say that I don't deserve the man that I'm with. But I tell you what, I'm still the stay-at-home girlfriend. He still protects me and provides me with a life that, like, like I think I'm literally living through the love of my life right now. Like, like, like this is that phase. This is that era. Excuse me, not phase. This is that era for me. I mean, he, he does for me what no man in my life, including my own father, has ever done. But in order to vibrate, in order to be a vibrational match for this guy, I had to go to therapy. I had to kick the will to ever give a Dusty a chance again. I had to transform. I had to do all kind of Beyonce lemonade when she's like, oh, I'll plug my menses with the book of the this and I did this and I saw the double and I, I mean I had to do shadow work I had to kick my own behind and it's so funny that you guys don't know that that's what the level up is about so you're lying on black women when you say that we don't enjoy or we don't appreciate constructive criticism we appreciate constructive criticism because that's how you grow that's how you improve. That's how you get right. We like that. We love that. We need that. We want that. But Kevin Sams is abusive. He, he is verbally abusive. I can't wait until that woman wins her case against him because, I mean... I remember being doxxed and humiliated and I got to the point where I was just so depressed I could barely function from the trauma. That woman had to be as traumatized as I was, if not more so. Maybe not more so because there wasn't, you know, certain things involved that were involved in my case, but I'm just like, that's hard to be humiliated in front of so many people, thousands of people, in her case, millions of people. That's hard. And he loved it. And she was so polite. You can say that she was asking too much, but was she a nice girl? Was she kind? Was she mean? Was she rude? Was she a sweetheart? Did she deserve for somebody to be mean to her like that? Why do you guys, why don't you value kindness? Niceness. That matters to women. When a woman cannot love and be loyal to a mean man. Oh, she can marry one, she can use one, but she can't. It will turn her cold. It will turn her cold. She's going to leave or she's going to cheat. It hurts us so bad. And the thing is, these men, what they won't say is that they love to hurt black women. They will go to all kind of divested women who have clearly carved out spaces for themselves to be by themselves. And they will go out of their way to find these women and harass them. I don't know how many a black man has come up to me and other black women don't know me, don't know my name. Hey, I bet that ain't your hair. And the rest of this little black friends laugh. And I'm just like, dude, I don't even know you. But just, just to humiliate you gives them so much peace and solace, so much validation, so much happiness. I was looking at a girl on TikTok the other day and she was talking about how some black guy approached her and was like, oh, I bet that ain't your hair. 
excuse me, black guy, but not only is my, look, my real hair that you see in this photo, it's, it's called shrinkage, so it looks shorter in its curly state, but my real hair is longer than all of my wigs. Every last one of them. Y'all, please. But you know what? I decided when it comes to haircuts and all this other stuff, like I literally grew my hair because I had worked up some kind of pathology thanks to black men. And I felt like I needed to prove a point. But now I'm like, damn you, you don't have any rights to my hair. You don't have any rights to know what's real, what's fake. You're not my man. Mr. Uppity loves my hair, loves my hair. So it doesn't matter what you think, how you feel, and why do you think that it should? If I'm not your woman, if you are so oh like like these men are like, oh, well, if I see a black woman getting beat up on the street, I don't know her. She's not my responsibility. And I'm like, okay, well, other men feel that way about women you do know. So if they see your mama, your grandmama getting laid out by some cop or by some, you know, drunk guy at a club, they're gonna be like, Psh, I don't know that black woman. And nobody's gonna intervene. Are you gonna say, well, they had a point, they don't know her. That's a, lack, that's a lack of humanity. I have on my video, um, excuse me, I have a video on my channel where um, one of my neighbors is beating his girlfriend and it was me and a white woman who intervened. That white woman didn't say, oh, well, psh, she's black. Psh, that's a negress. I'm like, I'm not, <laughs> not really, no. And I didn't say, psh, I don't know her. We intervened, we, we recorded, we called the police, we did, we did what we would have wanted somebody to do for us. That's humanity. So you're propagating a lack of humanity like it's normal, when in reality, you're just not a well-adjusted person. Money will get a woman to look at you like beauty will get uh, beauty will get you know the attention of a man. That stuff can't keep you if you're ugly on the inside. But so many of these YouTube women who have bothered me, who have stalked me, who have slandered me, who have whatever, I sit so comfortable and so pretty because at the end of the day, I can look at myself and say, I'm a sweetheart. I love, I cry, I hold, I cherish. I lift people up. I'm not some jealous, envious person always trying to take somebody down. I love to see people do good. My soul is pretty. My soul is sweet. My heart is in the right place. And because I work to protect what I keep inside, I have the man that they want, but they can't get. I have an amazing mother. I have great sisters who think I'm a great person, even if I wasn't their sibling. Even, even if my mother wasn't my mother, I would still think that she was divine. I'm lucky. I have so much love and so much beauty in my life. And when I look at these people, the way that they treat other people, I'm just like, mm. Mm. that's ugly. That's ugly. With or without my makeup, I have a beautiful soul. And on my channel, I try to invite people to beautify their soul too. It starts with charity. It starts with kindness. It starts with speaking a soft word. Empathy. Sympathy camaraderie, seeking not to just hurt, be heard, but to actually listen. Like, if it weren't for all these insults and all these German Shepherd, BT, 
2000 hair had it whole again, you B word, you, you H word, every other word, like it, what, if it wasn't for all of that, these conversations could be had in a decent way. Like these conversations could be had to the point of getting somewhere. But why even into the conversation if you don't feel like you have to be accountable for anything? Because some of these men, they want slaves. They haven't gotten over the culture of slavery. They haven't. While we're busy, busy telling white people who love Confederate flags, you know, you know, get over losing your slaves. I'm like, have you gotten over being a slave? Have you gotten over the culture of it? Like, why do you want these women to just bow and scrape and do whatever you say and not have a mind? Why do you sound like a predator? Why do you sound like you need a child who can't think for themselves? That's not an adult thing. Sometimes because I'm such a emotional person, I ask my partner, I'm just like, look, I'm going to accidentally play in traffic. Could you just tell me what to do? And he was, he's like, you know, you have your own mind. You're not a robot. And I'm just like, but I'm going to regret if I make a bad decision. So in a sense, I'm asking him to control me. And he, and it made him uncomfortable. And so many of these manospheric, SYM, BMic, red pillic, they're dying for a woman to control. And my high value six figure partner is just like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to give you some freedom. Every, everything in my home, everything that I have, he's provided for me. And he still doesn't control me. I'm at leisure to do what I want, but what I do is him. There's love and compassion there. I'm a human to him. And I realize in my relationship with him that I have a low opinion of men because he he says he's just, you know, I'm just a normal guy. And I'm just like, I'm extremely impressed by you all the time, every day, multiple times a day. I'm amazed by you. I'm in awe because you have such a heart, because you have so much kindness and compassion and beauty of character. And I'm not used to men like that. Sure, I've got an uncle or two with a big, deep heart, but like a lot of my experiences in life, I mean, I can think of a couple of Muslim men who I know who are just really the, the beauty of the Quran, you know, and, and personify, so to speak. But I mean, by and large, I've only known men to be trash. And I feel like the good men out there get treated really bad because women have had such nasty experiences with men who don't see our humanity, who don't value us as co-equal human beings. Like I have a heart, you have a heart. I have a lymphatic system, you have a lymphatic system. I have a brain, you have a brain. Arm, leg, leg, arm, head. Like, like oh, I got that, you got that. Male, fee, male, okay? I got the male and the fee. I'm you and I'm extra. Value the me that you see, value the you that you see in me and the other part of me. You male, I'm fee and male. You're a man, I'm, I'm wound and man. But there's been such a dearth of men I've seen who walk and talk and live like my partner that like I just kind of gave up. And I'm with, and as a 30-something year old woman, I'm within my right. I'm, I'm within my right to be as narrow-minded and as private and as closed off as I want to be because I was open as hell. And those, you know pre-teens, teens, and 20s, open as hell, believed in everybody, believed the best about everybody, and got myself real hurt real bad for being so damn green. But I see that the good men are suffering with a lot of our rhetoric because they're like, well, what about me? Well, what about me? And great women are suffering under the, you know, manosphere Kevin Samuels rhetoric. Well, what about me? I'm good. I don't do that. I don't talk to my man like that. Whoop -de -whoop -whoop -whoop. But then again, that's why we would never call in. 
He can't give us anything we don't already have. I think Kevin cursed himself when he told that woman that she was going to die alone. Because no man is God. No, no man can take the position, the authority of God and tell you how you are going to die. That was written in a book a long time ago. The pen has been lifted and the ink is dried and that is not your call. Now watch how he dies. I'm up at Unicorn and I'm out of here.